Welcome back to another study of the book of God. We're going to continue in our study of the churches of the New Testament. Uh, we spent time uh, last week talking about the church at Samaria and looked there in Acts chapter 8 and spent a lot of time there. We're going to continue in our study and just go to the next chapter, uh, Acts chapter 9, and there talk about the church at Damascus. And it's, I think, very interesting to look at the church at Damascus. There's things there that perhaps we don't, we, we know, but we don't realize that we know. Okay? Because the Bible is consistent. Because the Bible teaches in such a manner that you can be assured that what is taught to one person or one group of people is the same thing that's going to be taught to the next group of people. We realize then that uh, this plan for the Lord's Church expanding, this plan for folks becoming Christians and such, and the, the plan for spreading this gospel becomes very efficient. And so there's a lot of things, really, that we know about the church at Damascus, even though we don't always talk about them quite, a, quite that much, uh, until we're talking about the conversion of, of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. Uh, usually about that time we'll talk about Damascus a little bit and, and maybe some, something about the town or something about some of the Christians there. But there's a lot that's said. And so I want us to spend some time uh, in this study looking at that particular church and uh, as we've been doing so far, go and look at some of the, the um, well, aspects of the town, aspects of the area, what it is that those folks had to fight against, the, the problems that they faced and so forth from a societal standpoint or from a, from a you know, physical standpoint, some of the things they had to deal with, and then go from there and talk about the spiritual truths and make some applications to ourselves, okay? So let's go ahead and get started in that. And as we begin, we want to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll begin our study of the church at Damascus. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for the blessing of this opportunity. Study thy word. Pray that we might take the things that we learn today, that we might take them, we might apply these to our lives. We might take and realize the beauty of thy word, the truth of thy word, how that that thy word is something that can be applied even today in the 21st century, just as it was applied when people lived uh, in the first century. And please help us that we can take what we learn, that we use it, and that we tell others about it as well. Uh, we're so thankful for Jesus, for his great sacrifice, for thy love, so thankful for the truth, and so thankful for all the blessings you provide day by day. As you please be with those that are sick, those that are bereaved at loss of loved ones, and are mindful of those uh, that are near and dear to us that, that need thy help and ask thy blessings on each and every one. So thankful for Jesus and for his great sacrifice. As to find faithful and have a home in heaven with thee whenever this life is over. As all these things, name thy son Jesus, and amen. Now, when we're talking about Damascus, we're talking about this particular area of Damascus. I find it very fascinating to think about. Uh, you go over here to the book of Acts in chapter 9, and we talk about Damascus. Of course, we ought to be familiar with this particular map. Uh, this map, of course, shows us uh, the areas of Samaria, the areas of Damascus, and so forth. And I want us to focus on that at this time. You talk about Damascus. We're talking about the northernmost end uh, really, of, of this map in particular. Um, this is outside of Israel. Now, remember, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, uh, here is the plan for God's word to be spread from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. When you look into the Bible, we find that that's exactly what was going on. It started in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. It spread from Judea. It spread into Samaria. We're reading this in Acts chapter 8. But don't forget also the statement that's found in Acts chapter 8 where it says in verse number 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Please take that literally. They went everywhere preaching the word. This group of people that had been uh, there in Jerusalem for, um, well, I don't know how long, but it was a good while. If you think about from Acts chapter 2, to this time period, it's, I mean, it's, it's not just a day or two. 
I mean, it's been months these folks have been together. And no doubt people have left and gone home. Because again, remember what brought them together. What brought them together into Jerusalem was the day of Pentecost. And I will pass over before that, but then the day of Pentecost 50 days later. So the Pentecost feast was there. And this was all taking place at this time. And whenever folks uh, heard the word, they believed it. They repented of their sins. They confessed Christ. They're baptized. When this happens, then a whole bunch of people just kind of stay on. They didn't really go home after that. And that's why we read about how the, that those who had land sold the land so that they would have money to give to those. Because you had folks in town who, you know, they lived however many hundreds of miles or thousand miles away i don't know but i mean it was all over the place they came from every nation under heaven so they've come here to this place and now they don't have any food you know they ran out of supplies they ran out of provisions they weren't weren't going to stay this long but now they need to stay this long because they want to learn more and more and more about christ now it's this group we find in Acts chapter 8 that endured sufferings Acts chapter 4 talks about it uh, they go to God in prayer about these things. Grant thy servants with all boldness we may speak thy word as they saw the uh, imprisonment and the beatings of the apostles there to tell in Acts chapter 5. Then as you talk about uh, you know, Philip being uh, there and his uh, work in Jerusalem, first of all, with the Grecian widows, and then later on his work going from Samaria, and of course the Bible shows us, and you can kind of see it on this map a little bit, he would have gone down uh, past the West Bank and down past Jerusalem, down toward Gaza, or Gaza, you ever heard of the Gaza Strip? Gaza down there by the Mediterranean Sea, and after that, Acts chapter 8 tells us, uh, the tail end of Acts chapter 8, it says how that the, he went up and headed up towards Caesarea. So what he's done is he's followed the coast all the way up, uh, from the southern end, and he's followed it all the way up toward the north end uh, of the area we, that we would think of as Israel, but he's up on that northern end now. Well, in the meantime, you go back to the first part of Acts chapter 8. In the meantime, you had these folks who were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the word. And so they have gone and left Israel as a, as a nation. They've left the national boundaries. Uh, yes, perhaps some of them were going home, perhaps some of them were going wherever, but you had folks headed toward this place called Damascus. So they've gone there, and the word of God has spread to that area. Now, you don't read about it immediately in Acts chapter 9, because Acts chapter 9 focuses on uh, Saul or Paul, focuses on him, focuses on what happens to him and how the Lord met him on the road going from uh, Jerusalem up to, uh, or down to, as, as the case may be, but going to uh, Damascus and all the things that happened there. But whenever he gets there, understand, and what, we're going to get into more detail with this in a moment, but when he gets there, there is a church. There's a congregation of God's people that's meeting in that town, and he goes to them. Now, Rest assured, there wasn't a single person there that Paul converted to the Lord. I mean, that didn't happen. And you know why. He hadn't even got started yet. There wasn't a person there that he converted to the Lord. Somebody else did it. I don't know who did it, but God does. Someone else, uh, maybe a group of people, uh, worked hard to establish a congregation in Damascus. So that's what's going on in that area. And this is the result of the scattering that took place, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. The people scattered and they went everywhere preaching the word. Okay? And so, like I said, just to me, just a fascinating set of circumstances and fascinating things that's going on. I want us to look at the city of Damascus for a moment, if you will. And notice here in Damascus what was going on. We find, uh, for example, the fact that this city was situated near a desert oasis, all right? Uh, this was a place of abundant water supply. It's a very rare situation, but they had it. And, of course, uh, that's where so many times cities are established and built is where you can have abundant water, and that's what happened here. The Abana River, the Farper River, 
was there to supply the city with water. Now, if Abana and Farper sound familiar to you, uh, then I know you've been paying attention. You remember Second Kings chapter 5. And the first 14 verses talks about Naaman and how Naaman was the captain of the king's guard over Syria, not Assyria, Syria. This is the area that he'd been talking about. And whenever Elisha said, uh, you know, go wash in the Jordan seven times, then he gets upset and he said, are not Abana and Farper the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And so, and we can talk about that if you'd like, but notice, I'm looking at the geography for a moment. Are not the Abana and the Farper, the rivers of Damascus, this is the place. And so this place, uh, Damascus, but this, these rivers supplied their water uh, needs and so forth for years and years and years. It was a great commercial city. In other words, they weren't really known for um, you know, armies and things. They weren't really known for being a military site or military base and that kind of thing. It was rather known for its commercial. And if you think about it, if you had rivers like abandoned Farper, maybe folks would get on boats and, and trade you know, up and down the river. Uh, not only that, uh, of course, it would bring goods in. Not only this, uh, being uh, around there, there was a crossroads, and its position was set up as a crossroads for the king's highway. And it connected the lands of the Far East, all right, to the Middle East. And so that's what was going on in those days. It was, I mean, folks came through there. And so not only did you have an abundance of water, not only did you have those types of things, but you had this great trade route going through, and so, yes, it was known as a great commercial city. Ironically, it was almost defenseless from a military standpoint. It really wasn't that, that great of a city, and like I said, didn't have a lot of military things at all, as far as that's concerned, but great commercial things, trade, and such as this, and folks just went there. What's interesting, I think another thing, and I, I get into all this, and, and maybe other people don't, so just bear with me. But if you go back, Damascus has been in existence since the days of Abraham. Now, you talk about an ancient city. You talk about a city that's been there for years and years and years. Just turn in your Bibles for a moment back to the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis in chapter 14, and the verses number 15, it just gives a passing reference to it. It's not like... Uh, you know, Abraham went and lived there or anything like that. But I find it fascinating to read this because you see these cities have been around for years. Genesis 14 and verse number 15 says and talks about how he divided himself against them, he and his enemies by night, and smote them. Now this is talking about when Abraham had to go uh, and, and rescue Lot. Lot had been taken captive by the the kings after that war had taken place and basically him and his family were taken hostage and so then um, the Bible says Abraham had to go and take 300 of his servants, well trained servants and basically form a posse and go get his nephew back from uh, from all this so you go to verse 15 it says how he divided himself against them he and his enemies by night smote them and pursued them to Hoba which is on the left hand of Damascus all right, so city there not far away from Damascus, but th that's the reference made. He, so uh, Damascus was a city that was in existence. And we find this, I, I do, I find it fascinating. We just see these names. We see these cities talked about. And folks, just be real careful about this. Don't ignore uh, the words. Don't, uh, <laughs> don't ignore the names. That's a better way to say it. Don't ignore the names. Don't ignore those uh things like that because there's all kinds of of names there's all kinds of city names and all this that really enhances it enhances your bible study i promise and so when you think about this the city of damascus exists today you can go i, I mean somebody can go i don't know if you want to go or not to that area but people go there the abandoned and the farper exist. 
This book is not a mythological book. This is not just fairy tales and stories. This is not talking about you know places that don't exist. It talks about places that do exist. And in this case, we have the blessing of knowing there's a city that exists that's been around thousands of years. Damascus, a city that is older than the United States by centuries. <laughs> I mean, just been there for years and years and years and all the way till today. But it was in existence then because here was Abraham chasing uh, and trying to get Lot, but chasing the enemies up into that very area. They're close by to Damascus and the next town over is where he ended up going. And so there he is. Um, not only is this the case, of course, with a uh, city as old as that, obviously it's going to be pulled into Bible history at various times. The inhabitants of Damascus went to war with David in the book of Second Samuel chapter 8. And so you can look over there as well. Second Samuel chapter 8, and this just, we're just establishing the city. We're establishing what was going on. And it's interesting, this place really wasn't that big of a military power at all. But Second Samuel 8 and verse number 6 says, David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts, and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. The inhabitants had gone to war with him, and you can back up and see this, but whenever David got there, again, it's not really a military city. And so what happens? David puts garrisons in there, and sure enough, they bring him the gifts. That's like saying they're bringing him taxes and, and things like this because they just got defeated. And just a, a statement of fact that he went in there and beat him up. He went in there and won. That's what happened in the days of David. A uh, famous king from Damascus was Benadad. Uh, you can go in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 15, 1 Kings in chapter 22. Benadad is how you say that name. He went to war with King Ahab, or I, I should say, uh, whenever the kingdom had split. Okay, so this is not the united kingdom like under David and, and Saul and Solomon. This is in the divided kingdom time period. And so you look here, and sure enough, Benadad was somebody that they had to fight and had to deal with. Where did Benadad come from? Well, Benadad came from this area of Damascus, this area of the Syrians, and so forth. I mean, you can read about him in chapter 20, ben Benadad the king of Syria. Chapter 20, uh, 21, 22, talks about there was a war, or three years they went, there was... There wasn't a war, I should say it that way. 22 verse 1, for three years there was no war. But then it came to pass then that Jehoshaphat and them, they came down and they're going to have war with them. And this is when uh, Micaiah was, was called up, you remember. Should we go to war with them or not? Should we go to war with Benadad? And should this all happen and so forth? You remember in Micaiah, uh, they had threatened him and everything, and so Micaiah just said, nah, yeah, uh, yeah, you'll win. Don't worry about it. Well, they knew what he was doing. And so he said, I want you to tell me the truth. That's when Micaiah said, uh, if you come, tells Ahab, says, if you come back at all from this war, then the Lord hadn't spoken to me. In other words, you better stay home. You better not get in that war, and you better not do anything about that. You are not going to come back alive. And it happened exactly as Micaiah said. And so in that war between Benadad, in this case, and, and Ahab and Jehoshaphat because of the split kingdom, um, because that happened, and then Ahab ends up dying over it. You remember he dressed up as, as a regular old foot soldier rather than the king, and the soldier on the other side saw Jehoshaphat and then all his you know, regalia and all this, and he's like, hey, that's the king, I'll leave him alone. Hey, here's a regular soldier. Shot, shot an arrow and killed him. But it wasn't a regular soldier. It was Ahab. So Ahab kind of outsmarted himself in that case. So there's a lot of things that's going on, like I said, when you think about the connection, biblical connection. The things happening between uh, God's people 
and in this case, Damascus or Syria, in this case. And so by the first century, it lost about all its political power. Uh, there wasn't a lot to be said about that. Again, you can talk about the commercial side and the and uh, trade routes and all those kind of things, and that's that's really been its claim to fame. Um, you know, like I said, Benedad came and went, and that's pretty much over with. So there never was, it really was that kind of a town. It was more a trade route. So this would be the place also where Paul was converted. Okay? So, like, if you turn your attention over then to the book of Acts in chapter 9, what you're going to find is that this is, of course, the record of the conversion of Saul, Saul who became the apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and, of course, Acts chapter uh, 26. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts chapter 26 are the places that, that you can look at and read about uh, Saul's conversion. A lot of times we talk about Acts chapter 9 and spend a lot of time there, don't we? And sometimes we forget that chapter 22 and chapter 26, those two passages uh, are Paul's record. Okay, This, what we're reading here, is what we might say is Luke's recording a thing. And of course, it's all good and true. But in Acts 22, Acts 26, Paul defends himself before the rulers, the, the various rulers at Rome. Okay, And whenever he's doing this, uh, he's standing before those people. Now he's giving the record, giving the account from his perspective and how things went. And so it's very important that we put all of these together uh, whenever we come into this type of a study. Okay? So, of course, um, here's Acts chapter 9. Paul breathed out threatenings and slaughters, it says, against the disciples. And he says he went to the high priest and desired of him letters uh, to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so, you see kind of how this is laid out in the beginning. He's leaving Jerusalem, Paul is. He's, he has uh, slaughtered, he has persecuted, he has done all kinds of wickedness, as we read about in Acts chapter 8. He's done all kinds of wicked things. And now he wants even more power or more authority. So he's going to go to Damascus. And that's where he's headed to, verse number 2. And go uh, and receive uh, authority. That's what that letters business is. He has authority to go in. And if he finds any Christians uh, up in Damascus, he can extradite them back to Jerusalem. That's all that's saying. Bring them bound back to Jerusalem. And no doubt to stand trial, to be punished, imprisoned, and so forth. And so I, I've got my, you know, I'm going to go up there, get my extradition papers, and bring a bunch of people back. That's what's going on. That's the plan, I should say. Verse 3 says that as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So he hadn't got to town yet, but he's getting close, and the light was shining around him, and he fell to the earth. Heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said to them, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Verse 5, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Some versions say kick against the goads. And so that's, a, that's an interesting study right there about the goads, uh, or that, that animal. There was animals, um, well, they, a lot of them had them. And there's these things, basically, that, that stuck out, and they were made of sharp metal or whatever, but they were pointed like, and if a, could have been a mule, could have been a horse, could have been whatever, but you had them saddled up, and they wanted to kick and rear back and kick at the wagon if you were, you know, trying to get them to go. Well, if they tried to kick, they wouldn't kick the wagon, or they wouldn't, harm you, they'd kick on these goads or pricks, and it, and it hurt their feet, you know it, and it's kind of like the old uh, adage of the carrot and the stick, you know you keep kicking against that you're just hurting yourself, that's why J Jesus says to him it's hard for you to kick against the pricks it's hard for you to kick against this it's not going to hurt anybody but you now 
the horse or the the mule or whatever animal you got pulling the pulling this wagon now he finally figures out that it's a it hurts a lot less to quit kicking and just to walk and do your thing or pull the wagon or whatever it is he has to do it's a lot easier just to do the job and quit kicking and usually an animal can learn pretty quick seem like some of these hard-headed men uh takes them a little longer and that's what jesus is saying it's hard you know what you're kicking against the goads and, and you know nothing's getting better here he trembling and astonished said lord what will thou have me to do what do you want me to do and he told him he said i want you to rise and go into the city he hadn't made it to the city yet but he's going to be there arise and get into the city he said and there will be told thee what thou must do well must do for what well must do lord what will you have me to do you get to town and you'll find out what i want you to do so as says the men which journeyed uh stood speechless hearing a voice seeing no man Saul arose from the earth verse 8 and when his eyes were opened he saw no man but they led him by the hand and brought him into damascus he's going to meet a man verse 10 named ananias ananias is going to tell him what to do and you know uh, just a side note here real quick that is really god's plan all along god has always wanted and intended for man to tell man what to do to be saved it, you'll notice when Jesus was on the earth and he had the, the form of a man, obviously he was born in this world. And so he was he was a you know God and man at the same time. But, you know, men looked at him and he looked like a man, obviously. He would speak to them and tell them about salvation and tell them about those types of things. But when Jesus comes back to his glorious state and he's at the right hand of God, just like we're reading right here. He does not tell man what to do. The intention is for man to tell a man what to do. Now still with the word of God and still the powerful word of God, Romans 1, 16, but it's God's word that is the power rather than anything else. You see, God wants willing participants. He wants people to come to him willingly. And you imagine standing in the glory of God. That, well, somebody uh, could not see God and live. That's, that was the warning to Moses. You cannot see God and live. And you can see some of his glory. Uh, but that's all. And so here in this situation, when he's knocked to the ground, and the light shone all about, all round about him. And he's asking, what we have me to do? When he rose from the earth, his eyes were open. Hmm, maybe his eyes were shut before that, you reckon? Maybe the light was so bright he had his eyes shut. The glory of God was so much he couldn't look. And then he tried to open his eyes when he did. He couldn't see anybody. He was blind. But God wanted a man to tell man what to do to be saved. And not God tell a man. See, so you, you think about this and just what, what we see here in this glory of God. If God himself told you what to do to be saved, you wouldn't do anything but what he said. God wants us to choose him willingly. Not be forced or not feel like we're forced. And certainly, like I said, if you met the glory of God like that, you wouldn't do anything except what he told you to do. Now, there's a day coming when we will all bow down. There's a day coming when we will all confess him. There's that day that is coming. But on that day when you see the glory of God and you fall to your knees, then it'll be too late for salvation then. Salvation is now. Salvation is when we listen to the word of God being preached by a fellow man to hear God's word, to believe it, and to obey it. So here's God's plan. It's the same thing with, uh, uh, well, Paul, but same thing with Cornelius. 
in a vision, he says, what must I do? Here's the, here's the chance. Here's the angel's chance. Here it is. You have the opportunity. What must I do? You need to repent and be baptized. But you notice he said you need to send for Peter, and he'll tell you what to do. It's always his plan for a man to talk to another man. You go back to chapter 8, same thing. When the Ethiopian eunuch was on his way back from Jerusalem, and he's going back to Egypt, and the Holy Spirit calls Philip away, and the angel gets him there. But who does the actual talking? It had been real easy for the Holy Spirit to talk to him. It had been real easy for an angel to show up and, and just appear on the, on the chariot right there and start talking to him. That had been easy to do. And if you'll notice, about any time anyone met an angel in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, they fell down to their knees. And even Samson's own daddy would say, I, we are going to die because we've seen God. That is the response of man when you see God's glory. That's the response of man when you see just an inkling of God's power. You fall down to your knees. So here is Paul being told, go to the city and to be told what you must do. Okay, And that's a little off my subject a little bit, but not much. Because we've got to recognize where the power is. The power for salvation is in God's word. It's here, Romans 1, 16. Not in a man, it's not in anything else. It's not in games and, and gimmicks and all of that. It's not fun, food, and frolic. It's not, uh, hey, let's just see what we can do to, to you know, pack everybody in. It is go and give people the word of God. Show them what God has said. Preach it and live it and tell folks to do the same. And see the blessings that come when we do it God's way. Okay? We'll jump back in, if you will. Jump back into the book, or rather to our chart over here, if you will. And when you do, we'll notice something else. You'll notice the church at Damascus. Now, we started touching on this a little bit. Obviously, Paul had to get there. He had to be uh, you know, ready to, to start in that work. And so what happens? Well, uh, its origins are unknown. But we touched on this a little while ago, and I'll just bring it up again. Based on the Bible's teachings, what can we know about its beginning? What can we know? See, there's a lot of things we can know. And what is it? Well, what do you think? Well, we know based on its beginning that they had to become Christians the same way the Jews on the day of Pentecost became Christians. Acts 2, verse 36 down to verse 41. They had to become Christians the same way that the Samaritans became Christians, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. And also the way the Ethiopian eunuch became a Christian, Acts chapter 8 also and verse um, 35 to 39. They had to become Christians the same way. I do know that much. They're not going to be taught some something different, some other uh, you know, gospel type things. So that will be that. Paul already tells us later in Galatians 1, there's no such thing as another gospel. There's perverted gospel or true. Not another one that's, that's of equal value or of equal, you know, that, that somehow is, is just as good. No, you're going to be saved the way they were in, on Pentecost. You're going to be saved the way they were in Samaria, the way the eunuch was. You're going to be saved that way or you're not going to be saved. So, the origins of the church at Damascus are unknown, and like I suggested, uh, perhaps through the scattering and other things, the folks became Christians, but we know it's going to happen in the same way. And something else is you see the character of this church. These folks, for example, possess knowledge of God's Word. They knew what God wanted and what God expected. And we see this from Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, uh, not only because of one of its members, Ananias, but really all the people. You find that all the people were interested in doing what God had said, and they were willing to teach others. That church was growing. In fact, it talks about the fact that there in Acts chapter 9, 19, how the, that they had peace. Look over there in Acts chapter 9 for a moment, and it tells us 
how that that church had peace. You know what? Um, turn your attention over there, and we'll read that together. He says, when he, when he talking about uh, Saul, he receives uh, meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul uh, tarried certain days, he says, with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And as you continue reading, he says, they had peace here. And how that the churches of Judea, Galilee, Samaria, were all edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the Holy Ghost, and were multiplied. Notice here, all these congregations, 931, all these congregations from Judea, Samaria, I mean, does that sound familiar? Judea, Galilee, Samaria. Isn't that kind of like Acts 1 8? Isn't that kind of like what, what Christ had intended in the first place? And now here we are, and they're doing exactly what God wanted. They possess God's knowledge, they possess the truth, and they were going to listen to it. I want to suggest to you something else is they were forgiving people. They were forgiving. You say, How so? Well, again, Acts chapter 9, verse 19. Uh, the disciples, uh, Saul tarried certain days with the disciples. Now, if you go ahead a little bit in verse 23, it says that they had taken counsel to kill him. Uh, the Jews did. Now, not the, not the church. The Jews had taken counsel to kill him, and laying wait was known as Saul, and they watched the gates night and day to kill him. Then the disciples, it's talking about the disciples at Damascus. They took him by night and let him down uh, the wall, let him down into a basket, uh, and then let him escape. Of course, there were city walls, so they let him down off the city walls so he could get out of town. Now, there's more that could be said time-wise on this because it wasn't like it just happened in a week or so. Uh, this is t this has kind of been some time whenever Paul's at Damascus. But it come to this point, they were forgiving why had Saul come into town? Why was he even in town or, or, or headed to town in the first place? He's headed to town, you remember, in order to persecute and to extradite all these Christians and take them out and bring them to Jerusalem for trial. He'd already killed a whole bunch of people. He'd imprisoned a whole bunch of people. He'd already been doing that, and his reign of terror had been going on from the tail end of Acts chapter 7 all the way through the first part of Acts chapter 9 until he was blinded, and he still went in, went in with that purpose. And this is, this is a reputation he would not live down, so much so that there were people who wouldn't even believe he was a Christian. Uh, they thought he was, it was just all made up, and you can see some of that whenever he gets back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9. But whenever he's here, these people forgave. It'd been real easy for them to say, hey, he's over here. <laughs> It'd been real easy to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, you're trying to do all this to us and hurt us and everything. Maybe you do deserve, uh, you know, kind of a taste of your own medicine. But they didn't do that. They lowered him down out of that basket so he could escape and so he could be free. They were forgiving people. I wonder, are we as knowledgeable as they are today? Think about that. He said, well, I'm not too sure about that. I don't know if we're really as knowledgeable as them. Well, don't you know there's a cure for that? And that's the thing. There's a cure. If you don't, if you don't think you have enough Bible knowledge, there's a cure for that. There's a way to overcome that where you can have the knowledge that you need. Same way, think about being forgiving. Are we as forgiving as they? You know what? Think about it. We as forgiven as they, they had to forgive a whole bunch, didn't they? They really had to forgive. And not only these folks had to forgive, but the people of Jerusalem were going to have to forgive Paul and on and on and on. I wonder if we'd be as forgiven as they were. We need to be, you know what? We need to be forgiving people. We need to be knowledgeable people of God's word. That's a fact. Well, like I said, there's not a whole lot we can talk about so far as Damascus goes, but I think this is plenty where we see there was a church there. There was a group of people trying to serve God 
Saul comes into their midst. He's baptized. Acts 9, 17. He's baptized into Christ. He's with them. And they're there to, they are there together preaching and spreading God's word until the day comes when they have to help him out of town. And they do so. And like I said, they're very forgiving people in that sense. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, we'll go ahead and stop for right now. And we'll pick up again with another church here. We're going to go through, like I said, different churches of the first century. And so I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope this little lesson has been uh, encouraging, helpful, challenging, to make you think about your life and who you are and our service to him. We'll pause for a word of prayer, and then we'll close. Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for this time we get to study together. So thankful for examples of good churches like Damascus. And we're so thankful that we can learn from them. So thankful that we can see how they fit in to thy plan for salvation, how they fit into thy plan for the church. So thankful for the blessings that we that we can see here and pray that we might take what we have learned. We will apply that we will be forgiving people, that we will be knowledgeable people. We'll serve thee and follow thee all the days of our life. So thankful for all that you've given to us. All these things, name thy son Jesus. Like I said, I'm so thankful that you're here. So thankful for our study. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.